everyone, and welcome to um, the webinar today, Querying the Narrative. Um, as we get started, we did want to let you know that we are recording this webinar. So yes, welcome. Um, my name is Jenny Wolgamuth, and I am a faculty member in the Measurement and Research Program in USF's College of Education. And I'm also co-chair of the Qualitative Advisory Group, better known by us folks here as the QUAG. Uh, so the QUAG is the College of Education-led university-wide group of faculty members who support the development of qualitative coursework um, and think collectively about the power of qualitative research methodologies and do really cool things like invite Dr. Shelton here to speak with us today. So this webinar is sponsored by the QUAG, um, along with the David C. Anshin Center and the College of Education's Graduate Student Council. Uh, thank you to Rachel, especially from the Anshin Center for supporting the logistics of this event. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm Alex Panos, and I'm an assistant professor of literacy studies and affiliate faculty in measurement and research and co-chair with Jenny of the QUAG here at USF. Um, I also serve as program co-chair of the Qualitative Research Special Interest, Interest Group, which is part of the American Educational Research Association. Um, we are really glad that you are all able to join us today to be in conversation with Dr. Stephanie and Shelton as she helps us think about querying the narrative and the importance of stories in resisting and rejecting oppressive legislation, um, especially such as those recently put forward in our own state of Florida, colloquially known as Don't Say Gay. Um, <clears throat> we invited Dr. Shelton to share with us here at USF as we across the Southern US navigate critical moments and the responsibilities we have to many groups in our lives, including pre-K-12 students and their families, students seeking professional certification in our College of Education, the public school teachers and educators in our region, and our colleagues, families, and friends. Um, before we turn this over to the fabulous Dr. Shelton, we'd like to share a bit about her professional background. Dr. Stephanie Ann Shelton is Associate Professor of Qualitative Research and Chair of the Educational Research Program in the College of Education at the University of Alabama and Affiliate Faculty Member in the Department of Gender and Race Studies and the Gifted Education Program. Her numerous and excellent <laughs> publications have appeared in Qualitative Inquiry, the International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education, Qualitative Research Journal, GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies, and the Journal of Lesbian Studies, as well as four books. She was the 2020 recipient of the American Educational Research Association's Early Career Award in Measurement and Research Methodology, and the 2021 recipient of the National Council for Teachers of English LGBTQ Plus Leadership and Advocacy Award. As Dr. Shelton gets started, please do use the chat um, and Q&A spaces to bring questions forward. We will collectively monitor those questions as Dr. Shelton speaks and hope to use the last 20 minutes or so of our time during this webinar to be in discussion um, together. Welcome, Dr. Shelton. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Um, and uh, I, let me just get started. That's what we'll do. Um, so who the heck am I? And why am I talking about this stuff? Um, so my background uh, relative to education, educational research, um, and um, these concerns relative to really problematic educationally based legislation goes all the way back to when I was a high school teacher for a number of years. Um, I ended up on the state superintendent's advisory board. Um, and uh, and it, it, was, it was a revelation to me, frankly, of just the ways that a number of the legislators understood education, understood what teachers did. Um, and, uh, and honestly, that experience was a cornerstone of why I became a qualitative methodologist. Um, it became a cornerstone of why I understand stories to be really critical um, to working against um, these sorts of, of bills um, and, and proposed um, legislative um, documents. And so that's why I'm talking about it. And I'm going to share uh, the process that we've gone through 
hear uh, a number of us here at the University of Alabama um, regarding some of our very problematic legislation um, that parallels and in some ways deviates from the don't say gay um, bill that that is on on the, the table in Florida. Um, so that's an overview. So what's going on? There's so much going on. Um, there are so many bills that um, various states are using right now. Um, <laughs> there, um, there are several bills here in Alabama that are working really hard to police higher education um, and academic freedom. And I'll talk more about those uh, shortly. Um, Arizona's got another one of those anti-trans bathroom bills. Um, every time they get thrown out of court or they get knocked down by, um, by federal judges, um, the legislators just pull them back up, just resurrect those documents and try to push them back through again. You've got uh, the Florida Don't Say Gay bill, which is um, you know where, where most of y'all are. Um, and we'll talk more about that shortly. You've got numerous anti-trans um, students bills related to sports. Um, and unsurprisingly, just given the ways that sexism and misogyny are often built into these bills, a lot of these bills are constructed specifically to protect um, girls sports because there's this assumption that um, that girls are not able to compete um, unless uh, they legislate on their behalf. Uh, there are numerous um, anti-gender reassignment surgery bills across the nation. Um, some of these make it illegal for youth to, uh, to get access to medical care that helps them um, relative to, to having um, healthcare access regarding their gender, um, their gender identity and the ways that they know themselves. Uh, there are a range of bills that tap into this language of divisive concepts, including uh, the ones in Alabama, which I'll talk about. Um, and I'm going to talk more about this divisive concepts um, notion anyway, because the Florida Don't Say Gay bill actually borrows some of that as well. Um, there are um, 37 states right now that have some form of anti-CRT bill um, uh, or some sort of policy that's likely to become a bill. Um, and there are a lot of parental oversight bills across the nation. And what a lot of these do, I'm sure some of you are familiar, is like they're they're proposing to film teachers to make all things that teachers do um, available through like public records requests, um, allow parents to just drop into the classroom and so on. And so there's a lot of bills that are happening nationwide. And you can see the bulk of them are situated pretty, pretty deeply within the Southeast, within the Bible Belt, although not exclusively. Um, and so there's a lot of, 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 of efforts to legislate education, K-12 education and higher education. Um, so I want to point out that it is not a coincidence that these bills all um, seem to come uh, in groups. That's, that's, not, that's not happenstance. Um, what is typically happening, for those of you who may not be aware, is that there are a number of lobbyist groups um, that uh, basically prepackage legislation um, and then they gift it to these various lawmakers. Um, and so it's, it's not a coincidence that you see very similar legislation rolling out across multiple states all at the same time. Um, a lot of times actually what will happen is the Southeast, um, they'll choose some of the, uh, the more uh, politically conservative Southern states, Alabama being one, um, and they'll use that as a test run for this legislation. And what they'll do is see, you know, are they able to move it into law? Like what are the legal contentions regarding that, um, that, that bill if it becomes law? Um, how well does it stand up to, to federal judges review? Um, and then if there is an, a successful test run um, in typically Southern states, um, then what they'll do is then roll it out um, across multiple other areas of the nation and multiple other Southern states. Um, and so that's something worth knowing. Um, because none of this is coincidental, it's all by design. The other thing that's happening, and this happens a lot in this sort of, of, of legislation, is that there is this, um, this, this use of, of rhetoric that packages these bills um, in a way that proposes that these bills are working out of concern and, and protection for children, out of concern and protection for communities, out of concern and protection for family values. Um, and there's also a lot of times, interestingly of late, um, language rhetoric in these bills that um, is, is very aligned with this notion of, of the, the, the discomfort 
that um, that some of these these concepts like LGBTQ plus identities, um, gender not being binary, um, racialized identities um, having um, being marginalized or privileged, um, a number of these bills use language that references the discomfort that those concepts create. Um, especially for white children, cisgender, heterosexual children, um, as one of the bases of justifying these bills, as again, um, part of this rhetoric of concern, we're protecting children. And so protecting children from this, this sense of discomfort and even potential guilt. Um, and that that's a part of, of a number of these, these, these bills. So querying the narrative, what do I mean by that? So I really, I have found Sarah Ahmed's discussion of, um, of queer feelings to be really useful um, in the ways that I engage with um, these various bills because Alabama has a lot of them all the time. Um, it's it's near nonstop. Florida stays in news for a lot of frankly really entertaining reasons. Um, Alabama does um, is doing a lot behind the scenes, below the radar. And so, like when we make the national news, um, there's fifteen thousand other things that have already happened. Um, and so Sarah Ahmed's concept of queer feelings includes this, this discussion of, of comfort and discomfort, which is, is really useful to me in engaging with this, this rhetoric of comfort um, and protection that's written into a lot of, of these bills. And so Ahmed makes the point that cis heterosexuality and white supremacy are, and she says, deeply embedded with public as well as private culture. And spaces where gendered, sexualized, and racialized norms get upheld create a comfort zone. Um, and so, you know, her point, which is not a huge surprise to, I suspect, the majority of you, is that these norms that exist that create these dominant groups, that create these privileged groups, it creates a sense of comfort and safety for them. Um, and when that's troubled and challenged, um, it's because that comfort is so deeply embedded in social norms. Um, and so people who are marginalized and oppressed sometimes won't even necessarily be aware of and notice um, those norms until um, they're pointed out to them. But people who um, are comfortable within those norms um, are, are really uh, resistant to being made uncomfortable, um, being made to shift in, in, in various ways. And then Ahmed also goes on to say that whiteness and cis heteronormativity function as a form of public comfort. Um, prioritizing the ease of dominant groups over those who are marginalized and forcing those who are excluded and targeted to fit in for the sake of those with comfortable identities. Um, and these bills, what they do is they work to legislate um, this, this, um, this fitting in effort that marginalized groups constantly have to participate in. It happens already just by virtue of the way that we're acculturated, the ways that we're socialized, um, the ways that a number of people with marginalized identities learn to stay safe in our society. Um, but these, these bills um, are working to, to basically make um, that law. Um, it's not you're, you're fitting in because that's um, a form of, of, of self-protection. You're not fitting in because that's what's safe in this particular context. You're being forced to fit in because your, um, your refusal to fit in with these norms is making the dominant groups uncomfortable and therefore we're gonna legislate their comfort, um, which then legislates marginalized groups discomfort. Um, so why narratives? Um, so what I learned, I mentioned earlier, I was in this teacher, uh, this, this superintendent um, teacher advisory group. Um, and one of the things that we would do is we would review um, legislation that was being proposed, bills that were being proposed um, that related to K-12 spaces specifically. Um, and the legislators would constantly over and over again, say something to the effect of, we're interested in data, we need data. Um, and what they meant by that was, we're interested in stats that align with what we think. Um, and a number of you are very likely um, engaging in quantitative research of some sort, and, and you know, that in the same way that qualitative research is critiqued sometimes for being subjective, those numbers are ultimately subjective. The things that you choose to ask, the ways that you choose to analyze, the things that you choose to term anomalies, the ways that you choose to prioritize particular findings over others. Um, and so what they were basically doing within these agencies and within these offices was making sure that they were manufacturing um, numeric data that, that basically made them right. Um, and so narratives became a really useful way to push against that. 
Um, they would basically throw these numbers on the table as like, see, here's proof of why this bill needs to pass as is, you know, you teachers have nothing that you need to say. Um, and over and over again, um, a big part of what I decided was my role was sharing stories um, of, of different ways that what they were proposing was actually going to be really um, adverse to, to the various children that I worked with and children across the state. Um, and the advantages of narratives, number one, it shifts attention away from the numeric data that potentially has been cooked for the purpose of, of, um, of aiding and abetting particular rhetorical platforms. But additionally, narratives can be really humanizing in a way that makes it hard to argue against them. Um, we see numbers as being like really detached and, and, and objective. Um, and so arguing against numbers doesn't feel like arguing against people, right? Narratives, however, um, necessitate people arguing against the narrative argument like understanding that they're now arguing against the humanity of another, another person. And that becomes a, uh, a rhetorically wobbly space for a number of these legislators because it's a harder argument to make. Um, and, um, and a lot of times when they then try to resort to invoking their own narratives, they're typically not very flushed out because they're just kind of made up. Or if they are, um, that's when having then the, the other data, the numeric data that counters their argument, it's like, well, but here's this also for your narrative. The um, narratives also offer specifics that stats just can't. They can't, they, stats are not designed to provide specifics. And if any of you, any of you who have engaged in like survey-based data know, sometimes it's a struggle to get people to respond to open response items anyway. Um, and so you're certainly not going to get specifics, but if you, but if you're engaging with people directly and you're talking to them about their experiences and you're talking to them about, you know, the ways that, that, you know, like how have you experienced racism in school? Like how has you being a queer student mattered in, in you know, in schooling or whatever, um, these narratives offer specifics that the numeric based data just cannot, um, and, and it makes it again, harder for people to argue against because it's like, well, you've got your data. I see your data. But in these stories, there's this consistent thread of blank. Your data doesn't take that into account, but this bill makes that really problematic. Um, and then the other thing that's really useful about narratives is that it allows people who are typically silenced and shut out of these legislative conversations to participate in this process. Um, there are a number of community members, a number of children um, who have stories to tell that can really support these efforts, they're not going to be able to engage if it stays just based in this numeric data that a lot of these legislators want to lean on. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I really advocate for narratives as um, a way, it's not the way, I want to be really clear, but it is a way that has often been effective in, in dealing with these sorts of, of, of bills. Um, so we're, we're at a place right now where it's like, what, what, what do we do and what can we do? Because I think that a lot of times these, these bills um, leave us feeling like um, we're helpless or all we can do is like rage into the storm. Um, and there are in fact things that you can do. And so what I wanna do with the time that I have left is talk through um, things that you can do and things that, that I and, and colleagues and friends have done. So, Lessons I've learned, and then I'm going to give you an example um, with specifics. So the first thing that's really important is that you need to know what's actually in the bills, what they actually propose to do, because one of the things that happens is a lot of times politicians will talk about, refer to these bills, and will do so in ways that are politically useful for them but they're doing it in a way that is in fact misleading. And sometimes they know that they're being misleading and they don't care. Other times that potentially is even how they've been explained that the bill is designed to work. But an example of this, um, our governor in Alabama, Kay Ivey tweeted quite recently that she had illegalized critical race theory, that she was taking hate out of schools, you know, et cetera. There actually isn't a law in Alabama that illegalizes critical race theory specifically. Um, uh, your governor, um, DeSantis, um, one of his takes, and we'll talk about this later in the presentation, but one of his takes on the don't say gay bill is basically that this bill is going to stop teachers from forcing kids to try to like pick a gender. Um, and those bills don't actually say those words. And the reason that I say that is because a lot of times, because of the way that our media machine works, it's really hard 
to get a clear notion of exactly what the bills will do. And it's really important to know what the bills actually say, because if you're arguing against things, if you're, if you're trying to, to counter things that are being rhetorically used uh, in media cycles, but are not actually written to the bill, you're really wasting your energy. Um, and so I, I do want to say that, that that's really important. Um, and it, in fact, is a useful way to leverage um, uh, community access too. And I'll talk about that shortly. One of the other things is I would encourage you to sign up for legislation tracking and updates if you haven't already. There's a number of free websites. The one that I use is Legiscan, but there are, there are Florida specific ones for those of you that are in Florida. <clears throat> There's GovHawk, for example, but these, these bills right now, a lot of these legislative, legislative assemblies are in session. And so these bills are moving fast. Um, they'll be revised um, on, on a regular basis. And they're very quiet about the revisions. They, they, up, they, they do have to provide um, those revisions as public record, but they do not have to make any kind of announcement about there having been a revision. And so having legislative tracking is really useful um, because one thing that I'm gonna talk about is that what's happened in Alabama is they've taken three or four uh, really horrible bills and like Frankenstein them together to make one really horrible monster bill. Um, but they did so under the radar. Um, and the only way that we were aware of that happening was by virtue of tracking the legislation. Um, one of the benefits of knowing what's in the bill is that it is easier to educate others um, because a, a lot of us know a lot of times people are not going to get involved in, in trying to counter legislation and trying to, to protest legislation in any way, potentially offering stories of the ways that this legislation is problematic unless they feel like the legislation directly affects them. You can't necessarily educate other people if you don't know what's in the bill. And these bills are really tedious to read sometimes. There's, and I will also say that a lot of times like these, these uh, legislators who are writing these bills, um, their, their strength is not writing. Um, and so sometimes like the bills will actually end up being like self-contradictory and that's useful for you to know, um, but it's hard to educate others. And then the other thing, like rallying the troops, this is not something that you're really going to be able to do anything effective against these, these legislations if you don't have help. But it's hard to rally the troops if other people feel like, well, this doesn't apply to me. And I'm going to talk more specifically about and about that in my example. Um, but you got to know what's in the bill in order to have other people understand like why they care about what's happening, what's being proposed in these various bills. Um, in higher education, um, one of the things that I learned um, and I'm going to talk about is the university is going to protect itself. Um, and, um, and going back to Sarah Ahmed's notion of comfort and discomfort, one of the things that's really been useful is communicating clearly to the university how these bills risk their comfort, how these bills risk their protection, um, because then they have resources that I as a private citizen would never have access to. Um, and that's been really helpful. Um, find out what mechanisms the institution has regarding legislation. The thing is like near Alabama, they have some sort of office or entity or something that exists for the purpose of being in communication with lawmakers. Um, and so finding out who those people are, finding out what those mechanisms are, and then folks are leveraging those resources, are leveraging um, access to those people. Um, and, and you need to, too. Uh, Choose your stories and your storytellers. Um, narratives are really useful, um, but being really particular about who your storytellers are too. Um, there is a, a really big thread um, in media and in a lot of uh, politically conservative spaces that academics are just, we're all just big old flaming liberals and like we're trying to indoctrinate all these students in these colleges and so on. Um, and so just having a bunch of faculty talk or having a bunch of K-12 teachers talk, like they can't be your only storytellers. Um, otherwise the stories are not gonna be as compelling and effective as you hope that they will be. Um, and so being really intentional about who your storytellers are. Um, and I'll talk more about that too. Um, keep tracking them, keep tracking them. Um, because I mean, they're working on these bills right now. Like these bills are like present tense are being worked on, revised, reintroduced, going through committees, et cetera. Um, and have tech 
um, we've gotten like a new version of one of the bills. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't have it in me to, to deal with this today. Uh, or we would have like a Zoom meeting with one of the attorneys and it would just be like, I, I cannot. Um, and so having other people that you feel like you can trust um, to keep you in the loop when you're not able to participate because you can't, you can't do anything if, you, if, you're, if you're completely demoralized and burnt out. So a specific, Alabama has, I'm saying three to five because there are, they're starting three in the House and then there was kind of a fourth, but then there was one in the Senate. So I'm doing three to five to kind of encapsulate all of that motion. Um, Alabama had three to five device, the divisive bills um, and they were being um, constructed publicly as anti-CRT bills. Um, and this is where learning what was actually in the bills was really useful because the bills were not actually explicitly about CRT. They used CRT as an example of what they were aiming to do. The way that we had understood them, the insidiousness of these bills would have escaped us. Um, and so in reading these bills, it became really clear. One of the bills was very specifically targeted to K-12 education um, and all the things that teachers could and could not do, very similar to the Don't Say Gay bill in Florida. One of the bills was very explicitly working to control what higher education faculty could do. And that bill actually had um, a section of it that explicitly said that if higher education people do this, like teach these divisive concepts with CRT as an example, um, that they would be fired. Um, which basically eradicates tenure, um, which happened in Georgia quite recently, by the way. Um, and then another one um, was more about like um, government agency um, contract work that faculty might do with government agencies. And so it was still very specifically related to higher education, what higher education faculty could do, but it was in relation to, to government contractors. Um, and one of the other things was there was a, there was a lot of anti-trans language in these bills that was escaping public notice because everyone was describing them as anti-CRT. And that was important for, for us to know. Um, and so um, we signed up for legislation tracking and that's one of the ways that we realized that the number had increased from three to four and then there was one in the Senate and so on. Um, and so one of the things that we did was and I'm, I'm, I wanna be really clear, like this was not like an independent, like solo effort, like a, a group of colleagues and I at the university have done this together. Um, and it would not have happened had they not been with me. Um, but one of the things that we did was we worked to begin educating others about what these bills said and what these bills um, were, were gonna work to do if they became law. Um, and um, and, and that, meant, that meant a lot of convincing. Um, all of us, uh, except for a couple, were faculty senators. Um, and so we, uh, we made a motion and brought to the floor that the faculty senate would talk about these bills because it wasn't on the agenda. Um, and there was initially a sort of a dismissiveness from a lot of the faculty where they're like, well, I don't do CRT, what do I care? Um, and then when we started to explain that, no, these bills actually would like illegalize you collecting demographic data. These bills would illegalize you referencing gender. Um, these bills would illegalize, uh, you know, you like once we started laying out like, no, this is actually what these bills say. Um, there were a number of people across the university that started to realize like, hold up these are scary. Um, and I will never forget during, um, as a faculty Senate, we passed a resolution um, condemning these bills and demanding um, support and, um, and action from administration. But when we were initially proposing this resolution, there really was a lot of, 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 of hesitation and refusal because there was this attitude of, well, this doesn't apply to me. And once they started to understand what was actually in the bills, um, there was a faculty member that works um, out, the University of Alabama has um, like a water research center. Um, and one of the, the, the scientists in the water research center was like, if this passes, I can't do my work. Um, and, and the point then became like, if, if she can't do her research on water because of these bills, who in here thinks you're gonna be able to do any kind of research? Who in here thinks you're gonna be able to do any kind of teaching? Um, and then on top of that, um, rallying the troops became a lot easier like within the college of education itself when various departments and programs started to realize like this is what these these bills mean for you this is what these bills mean for your students this is what these bills mean for the school sites where where you go where your students go 
Um, and so rallying the troops was easier because we were able to articulate what was in the bill. Um, if we had not had that information and we had not been tracking them to be able to give them updated versions of these bills, without doubt, there would have been a, a pretty heavy um, just antipathy. It doesn't affect me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of the university is going to protect itself. Um, once the Senate became involved, that's when we started to find out who these people were that on behalf of the University of Alabama um, were involved in direct communications with some of these legislators. Um, and initially, he was pretty dismissive of the bill that directly uh, would affect K-12 education. I mean, his attitude was, you know, K-12 is not my job. I work for the university. My job is higher education. And so one of the ways that narratives were really useful was giving him stories that served as examples of how if this K-12 bill passed as it was, it was going to negatively affect the university. And so, for example, articulating to him, like giving him specific examples, specific stories of if this, if this bill passes, um, all this grant money is going to go. If this bill passes, we're not going to be able to certify teachers anymore. If this bill passes, we're not going to be able to certify counselors anymore. Um, and so him appreciating the ways that higher education was directly tied to K-12 um, and this is one of the ways that the College of Education directly was very important was because I, had the College of Education not been involved, I think it really would have just stayed this, well, our job is higher education. Um, and those, those stories became really critical um, for him then being able to articulate to his superiors how these bills risk the university's comfort, how these bills risk the university's well-being. Um, because unfortunately, to expect an institution to just do something because we believe it's morally right is not realistic. However, to leverage understandings of resources in ways that make the university understand how these, these bills are gonna adversely affect them is very effective. Um, <clears throat> and so that's where the, the, the figuring out what the mechanisms are and leveraging them. And so the University of Alabama ultimately sent um, representatives, um, legal, um, legal advisors and lobbyists to Montgomery during like they're there now during the legislative session to talk to these people who have authored these bills. Um, and that would never have happened had we not been able to choosing your stories and your storytellers offer specific stories of ways that these bills are going to matter. They already had all of the statistical data. They didn't care. Because in effect, they were basically using their own stories of like uh, the time that my grandchild was, you know, made uncomfortable in school or the time that, you know, somebody called my wife a racist or, you know, or whatever. And it's like, cool, we hear those stories. We're going to counter them with all of these. Um, and so um, leveraging institutional resources, the stories were really critical in making that happen. Additionally, um, we, um, we reached out to faculty across the university. We reached out specifically as the College of Education Senators to the College of Education faculty and staff and asked them for their stories too. What were they willing to share? And then we put all those together and gave them to these, to these, um, these university representatives um, to share with these lawmakers. Um, and that was really useful. And so keeping track of these suckers. Um, so here's the thing. These bills were all separate um, and, um, and by virtue of talking to uh, the individuals who were acting on behalf of the university, one of the conversations they had with these authors of these bills, um, a lot of the, the legislation was very specific faculty did. Um, and um, and the, the university representatives understood once we'd had some conversations like that, like that can't happen for a range of reasons, um, including dollar signs that can't happen. And so then sitting down with the bill's authors and saying like, what exactly do you intend? What exactly are these bills meant to do? Um, and what, what they found through having, what they really wanted was for, um, for faculty and teachers to not be able to make students believe something which already kind of is the case, um, but that was helpful um, because then that allowed for there to start being conversations about ways to edit the bill. Um, and, and there started being ways to start um, consolidating these multiple bills and only having to track the one. 
Um, and I'm not going to lie, there's still really problematic language in the newly revised one. But again, we've had conversations with these representatives who act on behalf of the university, uh, again, with stories about these are these are things that are still problematic relative to these revisions. Um, and so the tag team partners have been really useful just because, again, like there are just some moments where we, we, we couldn't, like one of us couldn't, two of us couldn't, we couldn't make a meeting, whatever. Um, and so this, this, this concept of, of comfort from Ahmed, Ahmed talks about how comfort is an elastic concept. And this has been really useful for me to not just be in, const, in a constant state of rage because one of the things that Ahmed talks about is that comfort and discomfort are elastic. They're not static. Um, and sometimes the, the structures, the structures that exist to protect these institutions, protect these norms, protect these dominant groups, they're not going to be willing to basically throw the couch out and get a new one that everybody can sit on, right? Like they're not going to be able to, to throw the couch out. They're not willing. The couch is too comfortable. But what Almond proposes is that because comfort and discomfort are in fact elastic concepts, are negotiable concepts in many cases, you can stretch the couch to make more space. You can stretch the couch to allow for different understandings. Um, and that's been the way that we've tried to approach um, dealing with um, the legislation here in our state, understanding that I mean, there's not gonna be any table flipping because we just don't have that kind of power. We can't do that kind of, like we can't make these legislators stop proposing these bills. We can't make, make these legis legislators stop moving these forward through various committees. What we can do is work um, offering to be uh, experts for, uh, for expert testimony, um, offering to give feedback and stories um, to these people that are acting on behalf of our university and other universities across the state, um, offering to give um, stories and information to um, the various K-12 organizations that exist within Alabama that are there at the Legislative Assembly right now with the effort of trying to figure out how to stretch the couch. Um, try to stretch what is allowable relative to discomfort, trying to stretch who's allowed to be comfortable. Um, and so rhetorically, that's been really useful um, related to just frankly my own well being and also trying to figure out like the best ways to negotiate and move forward. Um, and so um, the example I'm going to offer to all of you is the don't say gay bill. So Specific language directly from the bill, which you may or may not have seen, is it may not uh, it may not encourage discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in primary grade levels or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students. I can't tell you what to do in your own state. Um, I, I got I got my own problems in Alabama, but what I will say is one of the advantages of this bill, arguably, is that a lot of this this language is subjective. So like, what does it mean for it not to be age appropriate? Who decides what that means? Who's going to enforce that? Because it potentially gives some school systems some degree of, of elasticity of being able to stretch the couch um, to figure out like, what are ways that, that we can argue that this is in fact developmentally appropriate? Here are stories of ways that like, you know, here is this child who has, to two moms, um, this is therefore age appropriate and developmentally appropriate for the child to be able to engage in this topic at school. Um, and so knowing what the bill actually says and figuring out like what in that bill is, is potentially useful, um, both in terms of, of narrativizing um, to, to, to counter problematic aspects of it, but also just knowing what it says because your governor said, went on record publicly and said, We've seen instances of students being told by different folks in school, oh, don't worry, don't pick your gender yet, do all this other stuff. They won't tell the parents about these discussions that are happening, that is entirely inappropriate. And so there's this, this notion of like, this is the way that he's presenting this publicly um, and there's various sound bites and, and media cycles. There's this suggestion that like teachers are the bad guys and they're working to like indoctrinate students um, to, you know, to not have a gender and so on. But it's actually not what the bill says. Um, and it doesn't matter what DeSantis says publicly, what matters is what becomes law. Um, and so this is one of the reasons that knowing what's in that bill is really useful and figuring out ways um, to, uh, to leverage uh, the parts that are potentially going to allow for elasticity um, and trying to figure out like what are, what are narratives that can queer trouble um, 
challenge these dominant narratives because DeSantis is wrong. Like that's that's not what the bill's about. Um, but how do you make sure that that those other people that you could potentially leverage to help support your efforts um, understand what the law actually says? Because you can't you can't counter a bill with fiction. Um, that's not what's going to ultimately be written into into state law. There's also this threat of controlling education and controlling educators for uh, for the sake of protecting children. Um, and this is this is a place where we found through our own experiences that that narratives are really important because one. Of, so I said earlier, be particular about who your storytellers are. A really important storyteller is often the students, um, often the parents of students. Um, talking about ways that these topics get taken up appropriately, talking about ways that these topics were really important. Um, and so figuring out, um, leveraging stories to counter this rhetoric, like if, if the sake is to protect children, cool, use that as a way to queer the narrative. Okay, here's a way that doing this work in fact protects children. Here are all these various stories from children. Here are all these various stories from parents because it gets really hard to, to like, the point here is to make the teachers and the faculty the bad guys. Um, the point here is to presumably protect the children and protect the parents. It's a harder rhetorical platform to stand on if the kids and the parents are the ones that are providing the narratives. Um, and then relative to that, narratives can disrupt this notion of protection in ways that other researchers can't. Um, there, the the, the anti-trans sports bills are a good example. There is zero data that suggests that students being allowed to participate in the sports that correlate with their gender identity somehow make it cheating. There are, and there are in fact numerous examples of that, just not like, that's not reality. That's not what has happened over and over again across multiple sports, multiple grade levels, multiple um, age levels. That's not what happens. <clears throat> but the point here is to protect girls sports, right? That's typically what the, what the, the bills work to do is to protect girls sports because misogyny and sexism. And so narratives can disrupt that notion of protection um, in ways that all this other existent data just hasn't and won't. Um, and then this idea of like stretching the couch relative to this don't say gay bill and a bunch of others because others of you may be from other states besides Florida and Alabama. When you know what the legislative uh, proposals say, it's easier to stretch the couch because then you're able to tie it to things that the institution, the university cares about, things like teacher certification, things like teacher shortages, things like bullying lawsuits. Um, and this is also something that legislators are, are aware of and understand um, because they understand that like teacher shortages are real, that's nationwide. Um, we're already not able to staff our classrooms. This bill does this. Here are examples, here are, are stories from children, here are stories from teachers, here are stories from parents. Um, to be able to, to, to stretch the couch in ways that make people who otherwise feel like they have no skin in the game decide that not only do they have skin in the game, but they're gonna have to get involved. Um, because that way you're not fighting this war by yourself. You're not like this, this solo warrior, that's not sustainable. And I do wanna say just as a caveat, as I wrap up, I don't know everything, I'm learning too. I learn on a weekly basis at least, um, because as I noted before, this legislation is constantly moving and, um, and the group here is constantly tracking uh, now the, the synthesized Frankenstein version of the bill. Uh, but it's constantly tracking, like, what does it say now? You know, what's changed? And then communicating um, most effectively with narratives about ways that, like, well, okay, this revision is better, but here's the continued problem. Um, and so I'll stop there so that we have time for questions. Um, and, uh, and if I'm not able to answer them, I will be very honest and tell you that I cannot. Uh, because, again, I am not an expert. I am building the plane in midair as I go. Thank you so much, um, Stephanie, for the talk. I was um, texting with some friends as you were talking about how much I appreciated just your straightforwardness. Like this is so, like, I can put my hands on it. And so I just really appreciate it. Um, I would love to open the space for others to ask questions um, because I can track Stephanie down on my own and ask her questions when I want to. <laughs> Although I'm sure she'd be open to hearing from others. Oh, for um, sure. Um, I will also yeah. note the chat there. Um, there are links there that um, that that Alex put in there. Um, it, if if you're if you're wanting to oppose these bills, um, I really think that um, 
that you, you need to figure out what they actually say and then start tracking them. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I threw, I threw the link up to HB 1557, which is the house version of Don't Say Gay. I don't know if it's been updated since that, but I didn't have time to check fully if that was the most recent one. And then I also shared links to the um, trackers that the Florida state government helps provide for um, the House and the Senate. So um, for those of you who are interested in following um, some of the, the helpful tips here, um, those links are there. Um, My delightful friend Tanifa put in the chat. Yes. Hello, friend. Um, uh, if I would share again how I came to bringing uh, expertise on narrative to current policy issues. I was, I, I was talking about how um, when I was a high school teacher, um, I ended up on um, like a, a state level advisory board. Specifically, uh, what they wanted, frankly, was um, to be able to say that they had involved teachers in these in these legislations. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't choose a passive teacher when they appointed me to this committee. They, they to quote Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, they chose poorly. Um, and so, um, and so. Uh, they would often throw a lot of stats on the table, like this is why we need to pass this law and this is what we need to do for this. Um, and I, I realized um, that um, I was talking about how <clears throat> a lot of times when we argue against numbers, it feels very dehumanized. Like we're just arguing against numbers. Those aren't people, those are just numbers. Um, but when you start introducing narratives, it makes it a lot harder um, to, to be like, no, I don't care about that kid. I don't care about that kid's story. Um, it, it humanizes them in a way that makes it a lot hard. It gives them a wobbly or rhetorical platform to stand on, frankly. Um, and that's useful to us um, because they're frankly the ones with all the power. Um, and so making the ground beneath their feet a little less stable is really useful and narratives help to do that. I see another question in the chat that I wanna share. Um, Alina Alsi, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing their name correctly. So if you were a teacher, are you saying the best way to combat these bills would be to do it in your classroom and record the results? Do it in your class, like do what the bills say not to do? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and I would take a clarification at my read of it is that do, the, do what the bill says and then record the stories yeah, so do what the bill says and then record the stories um, of how that impacts. I, mm, I, I would frankly prefer that the bills not become rules. Um, so th that's that's not what I intended to say. And so if that's what I said or if that's what came across, and I do apologize and I appreciate your your clarifying your clarifying question. No, what I'm saying is um, if you're if you're a K-12 teacher, you have a pretty good read on the pulse of what your students and, and parents need um, and, and what they don't, right? And so you know, if you know what's in these bills, and that's one of the reasons you've got to know what's in the bills, if you know what's in these bills, you're able to know um, this is a family that would be directly affected by this if this became law. This is a child that would be in imminent danger if this became law. This is, you know, this is a group at this school that would cease to exist if this bill became law. Those are like that, like when you're talking about like rallying the troops, like those are like those are your people potentially. Um, and those become in some cases, if they're willing, your storytellers. Um, sometimes they're not willing, in which case some um, I will say um, anonymous surveys um, where they are willing to prove like type out stories is useful because then it at least gives you that information without putting them at risk. Um, but what I'm saying is um, don't necessarily do what the bills say because most of these bills are constructed in ways that are really problematic. Instead, if you know that the bills are going to do things that are that are dangerous, um, that are oppressive, that are, um, I mean, in some cases, life or death for some of these students, um, that's that's where the narratives come from. Like the, like those are your storytellers, um, and and you and sometimes you got to figure out ways to let them tell their stories without them, you know, having to be like the face. Um, and so we, we had pretty good success with anonymous, anonymous surveys. Like what we did was we had like a group meeting and we explained the legislation and then we embedded the legislation into the survey so people could like revisit it at their leisure. Um, but we also provided like a snapshot, like these are the key takeaways from the legislation directly from the language, like we weren't interpreting, we were quoting. Um, and then like from that meeting and the explanation, people then engaged with the survey and provided like examples. Um, if they didn't feel safe enough to like be the storyteller. 
Yes, that's exactly right, Alina. Yes, that's right. Hi, Misha from UA. Um, the couch look like? <laughs> there are a couple questions here about the stretching the couch. Um, Chaba um, <laughs> asked why comfort is so valued and promoted in American culture. Oof. What are the benefits of discomfort? Um, and then it looks like, and has more to say there, but I just want to continue with these other questions. Um, what does stretching the couch look like? How does that work if LGBTQ plus members um, mm -hmm. for anti for LGBTQ plus members of anti LGBT plus members rhetoric exists in that comfort zone? Can they coexist or is it stretching the couch a gateway to ultimately riddling? Yeah, them? those are all really good questions. Um, and I have a really bad short term memory. So it's likely that I will forget some of exactly what Alex just read. So I apologize. Um, so comfort, um, comfort in America, it, it is a fascinating cultural phenomenon that comfort is so accentuated and, and, and commodified too. Like there's a lot of things that are sold based on comfort as well. Um, but in terms of Ahmed's discussion of comfort, it's really more of like, um, like, socio-political, socio-cultural cachet creating comfort. Like I'm comfortable because my identities don't experience risk. I'm comfortable because like as a white person, I don't have to really generally be even cognizant of, of race. Um, it's one of the reasons that like, for example, a lot of white people say they don't like they don't have a race or I don't have a racial culture. Um, and so there's a comfort there that's potentially even unconscious um, that, that unconsciously people who are comfortable in that space will often work to maintain. And a lot of these bills, a lot of these legislations are working to maintain that comfort too. And in fact, that language is built into some of these bills. Like it will explicitly say that one of the things teachers are not allowed to do is teach divisive concepts because um, of students discomfort. Like that language is in some of these, these bills. Um, and, and Ahmed talks about how that comfort is really directly linked to, to authority and power. And so people who don't have authority and power are the ones that are constantly having to like adjust themselves to keep the other people comfortable. And so she talks, she uses this metaphor of a couch. Um, and, and what she says is most of the time what happens, like it's just, imagine like this is super comfy plush couch and you sink into it and it's, oh, it's so comfortable. Well, the only people that are allowed to sit on that couch are the people that are occupying these protected dominant identities, right? And so one of the things that often is really difficult is, um, is you don't necessarily have the, the, the power to like pick the couch up and throw it out, right? Like, I mean, you, you, you cannot, there's too many people in power sitting on it, it's too heavy. So one of the things that Ahmed talks about relative to comfort and discomfort is that you can stretch it. And so an example of a way that this looks, um, I, it's an article that I, I just wrote. In fact, um, there was a teacher, a K-12 teacher um, that, was, um, that was teaching um, about something related to queer identity and, um, and a pastor in the community found out and was like, she needs to be fired. Like this teacher is terrible, you know, whatever. Um, and the kids were the ones that were like, no, like, she's a great teacher, like you misunderstand, you don't have the context, whatever. And that's a stretching of the couch because the existing structures of oppression have not changed. That pastor still has community power, um, that teacher still is potentially at risk in the future. But in that moment, that couch has been stretched in such a way that she is able to at least take a seat and belong and not lose her job because of the students advocating on her behalf. And so that's like, that's, it's, an, it's an example of like the theoretical concept of just the stretching. Um, because comfort and discomfort are elastic concepts for Ahmed. And discomfort can be really valuable, but in marginalization and oppression. And so that's not a good kind of discomfort. Stephanie, you cut out just a little bit, right? When you said, and discomfort, and then uh, you cut it out for a moment. Would you repeat? I said, oh, I, I think what I said was discomfort can be good. Like there, there are lots of ways I've written a lot about like the value of discomfort. 
um, discomfort can be a good thing, but in these instances with these bills, discomfort is linked with being marginalized, being oppressed. And so these are not, these are examples of not good discomfort. Like these are not instances where you want to maintain that discomfort. Um, and then what's happening is the people who are comfortable because of the power they have in society um, are working to legislate and protect that comfort. Um, and so th this is, this is, discomfort can be good, but this is not, this is not exactly that. I, I really appreciate you making that point. I, I, I think it's so helpful to think about the ultimate power here and that like it's not being overturned. <laughs> so the stretching is necessary in these instances for those reasons. I just really like that made a lot of sense to me. I really appreciated that point. Um, Amy Fryer. Hi, friend. <laughs> As said last week, a pre-service teacher shared she no longer wanted to be a teacher because of the don't say gay bill. As a member of the LGBTQ community, she doesn't feel valued. I totally understand her point. I'm at a loss for words at the moment. Any recommendations for teacher educators? Yeah, this is a really good example of a way that you can make, you can try to get your institution to do something. Um, because at minimum, USF understands there are not a lot of teachers. Um, USF understands that um, there's a teacher shortage. USF understands that there are um, arguably, at least at the university level, protections um, for LGBTQ plus identifying people. Um, and so this is an instance where like, this is an example of a story, a narrative that could be supplied to the institution as like, you have a responsibility. If you want to continue to be a part of equipping Florida schools with a qualified prepared teaching force, this bill is gonna prevent that. This bill is already making schools hemorrhage experienced educators. That's, that's something the institution is gonna care about. Um, and then the other part of it is like invoking, like there are Title IX, for example, protections relative to things like gender identity. And so reminding them, like if we have, for example, pre-service teachers who are in these spaces that are feeling discriminated against and silenced by virtue of their identities, that's directly in conflict with university level policies. Even if the school's not responsible for that, the university potentially has ramifications for that. And those are things that the institution is going to hear. Those are ways that you get you. I know, I know. I was thinking that too, like they're trying to get rid of teacher education. But teacher education is, is in many cases the bread and butter. The other thing, uh, one of the things that Alabama seemed to really respond to was this idea of grant getting. Um, you're not going to be able to get, for example, federal grants. You're not going to be able to get grants from major foundations if you're not able to weave into it aspects of social justice, including um, genders and sexualities. That money's gone. Um, and even if USF decides they're not interested in teacher education, um, they are interested in millions and billions of dollars of federal grant funds. Um, and that was one of the things that I felt like, like that was a shifting point for Alabama was like, oh, wait, this is gonna cost us millions of dollars at minimum um, because it, it, it creates a situation of faculty recruitment, creates a situation of faculty retention. It creates a situation where faculty then become ineligible for applying for a range of external fundings. Um, and so even if teacher education is not an effective argument, um, those things are because they care very deeply about those things. Organizing effectively, I have to be really frank and say that we, um, we did not intentionally organize um, initially. Now we are very organized um, because now like there's just a lot to do and a lot to track. Um, initially, um, two of us, uh, another person and I, like we would text um, and we would just kind of like complain about these bills. These bills are dumb, these bills suck, whatever. <clears throat> um, and then, um, we started to realize that the university didn't really seem to have any interest in doing anything regarding them. Um, and so initially there was this sort of haphazard um, effort at one of the faculty senate meetings of, you know, we should talk about this. Um, Bye Mandy, I love you. Um, but um, we should talk about this. But then like afterward, um, when the senate voted on the resolution to send to the university administration, um, we sat together um, and there were all these super strict law, uh, laws, all these super strict rules, like parliamentary rules about like how many times you could talk and how long you could talk and once you would talk twice before a new motion came to the floor, blah, 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 blah. 
And because we had organized and were together, we planned out this person's going to talk at this point, this person's going to talk at this point, because basically it's like, if this is the game that you want to play, we have come prepared understanding the rules this time. Um, and so, I mean, that's one of the ways that, that we did that um, was, was trying to get, and is there a way to identify who are the lobbyists? I think, uh, yes, 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 there are. If you go to look at the, the, the bills, the authors are listed. Um, and it's also really helpful if you're like, well, I'm not like, I, I'm more of a letter writer. And I meant to actually mention this. If you're more of like a letter writer, first of all, a really well-crafted letter is going to do far less than a lot of letters. This is an instance, as a qualitative researcher, I'm saying quantity is far better than quality. Um, and this is another reason that having a group is useful is because y'all can all inundate whatever these offices are. Um, and so you can find out who the authors of these bills are by looking at the bills, the authors' names are listed. The other thing that you can also look up is what committees have taken those bills to consider them. And the reason that's useful is because then you can write directly to those committee members as well. Because while it's in committee, it's really the best time to try to fight them. Um, that's the best opportunity to basically just let it die. That's the best opportunity to try to get it revised. Um, and so knowing what committees are considering these bills is also really useful in trying to get something done. We had one more question from Alina again, asking about um, ideas for students with busy schedules. Um, yes. Do you have thoughts on how um, students can work to come together? Yeah, I absolutely. Um, I, you know, there's already a number of affinity groups at your institution, I would be willing to bet, um, that are directly um, directly going to be affected by by these bills. Um, there are going to be like teacher educator groups, for example. There are very likely um, various LGBTQ plus related affinity groups. Um, there are probably social justice groups. There's other groups that are not necessarily directly invested in these issues, but are still invested in like issues of like social justice, critical education, whatever. Um, that is a, like, those are people that you need to, like you need to reach out to those, those, those groups and you can just do it cold and just say, like, we did that. Like, we were just like, we need help. Um, and so we would just like reach out to like people and be like, hello, this is information that we want you to know. Are you interested in working with us? And almost always, sometimes like we didn't get a response or somebody was like, no. Um, but in almost every instance, people were like, oh my God, yes. Um, and that was nice because then it's like, that, that's the rallying of the troops. Um, and, and these bills sometimes are really clumsy. They're really badly written. Um, and if you've got a group of people, you can even divide that up. Like I'll take page one, you take page two, and then we'll confer and talk about like what this thing actually says so that we have an understanding, but getting like plugging into these various groups. And I would also strongly encourage like relative to students getting involved, plugging into faculty groups because the faculty are far more likely to eventually be able to get to the people that are like the university lobbyists, the university legal counsel, um, because that like that was the game changer for us was finally getting to those people. Um, and we use the faculty senate to do that, in fact, because we were just like, we need to talk to people. The university's got folks that do this stuff for them. Who are those people? Um, and the faculty senate had cachet and power that we as individual faculty members did not have. Um, and so we brought those people to a faculty senate meeting and then we're like, now we know who you are. Um, and so then we stayed in contact with those people and we're just like, hello. And so we've met with that, those people multiple times outside of faculty senate now, but we needed faculty senate as a way to connect to those people initially. And so plugging into these various groups gives you connections, gives you cachet, gives you leverage that you're not gonna have individually or even as a group. That's so helpful to hear that. Um, and I just wanna say we're a little bit over time, I think well worth the being over time. Um, but on USF's campus, I am happy to take emails from folks about these topics and try to work to make some connections. Um, my email is ampanos at usf.edu. So folks here can feel free to get in touch with me and I'm happy to serve as connector in different ways, however I can. Um, but I just, once again, Dr. Shelton, Stephanie, Thank you for sharing hey. about your experience and your research. Um, it's sure. been so helpful, um, so tangible. Um, and if you would like to be in touch with Dr. Shelton, um, she shared her email, but it's sashelton at ua.edu. And thank you again to the David C. Anchin Center, the Graduate Student Council, and um, our colleagues in QUAG for ensuring this event could take place. We really hope everyone is finding a measure of equilibrium at this time. 
and that this conversation, Dr. Shelton, you started today can carry us forward and keep our, our work going. Yeah. Strong, so. I wish all the best. I really do. Cause I mean, it, it, you can do something. It is not useful to just be like, well, dumb bills. Um, you can do something. Um, and it's okay if you don't know exactly what you're doing at the beginning, because we surely did not, but it's made a difference for sure. All right. I appreciate the invitation. Thank you all so much. And I love so many of the people at your institution. Um, so many of the people at your institution, I adore you all. So thank you for the invitation very, very much. Um, and y'all do the work and be awesome because it's important. Thank you. Thank you.